Well, I tell you, my friends, it's not often that a member of the European Parliament gets that kind of introduction. We, uh, we MEPs are not generally the most popular people in the world. Um, no, don't feel you've all got to rush forward and contradict me when I say that. I've got used to this over the years. We're a pretty low-profile bunch. We have very minimal visibility. But I must tell you the story about the only member of the European Parliament who has instant name recognition wherever he speaks. And that is a Christian Democrat colleague of mine from Luxembourg who glories in the name of Mr. Goebbels. And I will never forget, I promise you this is a true story, I will never forget when Mr. Goebbels first addressed the chamber of the European Parliament. There happened to be a British deputy speaker in the chair that day. And when he saw the name Goebbels on the electronic speaker board, there was this moment of pure kind of faulty towers. He became more and more agitated. You could see him muttering to himself, don't mention the war, don't mention the war, don't mention the war. And when it finally got to Mr. Goebbels' turn to speak, he was in such a state, he said, I now call Mr. Goering. I mean, Dr. Goebbels. I mean, Mr. Goebbels. Um, so for the rest of us, it is wonderful to be given any kind of platform anywhere. And thank you very much to the CEI for, for having me here. Um, and it is a particular pleasure to be addressing this institute, which has done so much for the cause of personal freedom and competitive enterprise. You know, a lot of things have changed in the world since your foundation in 1984. Things are changing still. A lot of established regimes are on their last legs. You know, Mubarak has gone and Saleh has fled uh, and Gaddafi is on his last legs. But Smith stands. The <laughs> the benign autocrat of the free market movement uh, reminding us of what it is we're here to do. You know, it's, a, it's so nice coming here from Europe. I, I left Europe and, as you probably know, the EU is racked by strikes and demonstrations at the moment. Every day in Greece, in Portugal, in Ireland, there are uh, crowds out demonstrating. In France, as I left, there was a huge protest uh, of, of people very angry because Sarkozy is planning to raise the pension age to 42 or something. And what a thing to come here and find that there are crowds on the street the other way around, you know, with signs up saying, taxed enough already, and don't tread on me, and who is John Galt? You know, and... Um, it, 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 or you always get a reaction from the Randians, you, or in any audience, in any audience. But, but I, want to, I want to leave you with this, uh, with this thought, my friends. That didn't happen on its own. People in any polity, people in any country, respond to the incentives structured around them. And what we're seeing now is the result of decades of work by, well, not to put too fine a point on it, by you, by the people in this room, the, the, the movements that you've supported. Back in 1984, when the CEI was getting started, you sowed dragon's teeth. And those teeth have now leapt out of the ground as fully formed hoplites with the sun gleaming brilliantly on their burnished plumed helmets and their greaves and their breastplates in the form of a popular reaction against government. I mean, talking of, uh, 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 of Ayn Rand, I was, what a brilliant thing to see. Uh, the first thing I see on the, the sponsors list is that the, the Railroad Association is backing the CEI. So unlike in Atlas Shrugged, in real life, they're actually backing competitive enterprise and, and pursuing <laughs> rational self-interest. Now, again, <clears throat> that doesn't happen on its own. I, I, I'm not, Fred will tell you, I'm not on any kind of percentage here, but I really am grateful to all of you who have, uh, who have supported CEI and who are doing so tonight. And I will go back uh, to the United Kingdom happier to think that I'm leaving behind me patriotic Americans who are prepared uh, to back with concrete and hard uh, cash the ideals which people like me are uh, enunciating. You know, what makes CEI different? What makes it, I think, unusual, even in the free market and conservative movement, is that it has always been very careful to draw a distinction, which is often lost on lefties, between being pro-business and being pro-market. CEI, because it is genuinely libertarian, genuinely in favor of enterprise, has, I think, to some extent, probably cut itself off from some sources of corporate sponsorship. But that distinction between being in favor of the market and being in favor of big industries has never been more important than now. 
I mean, never mind what's happening. I could, I could make a, I could go for some easy targets talking about what's happening under this administration. Look at what happened under the last administration. Let's make this a little bit more uh, immediate, right? There you had a right of centre government, a right of centre presidency, which was pursuing protectionism, large federal spending, budgets, and in the end, bailouts and nationalisations. What begins as one or two uh, pragmatic compromises, which are always advanced as being sensible, undoctrinal, undogmatic, can quickly decline into a system of crony capitalism. Now, here's the thing. We've been winning the battle of ideas. We've been losing the battle of implementation. The speeches we've listened to tonight, if somebody had stood up and said that 50 years ago, they would have been regarded as insane. Think of how extraordinary has been the intellectual triumph of the free market right. In the sense that almost nobody now will argue from first principles that the world would be better off if governments planned things. The advance we've made since Hayek and Friedman were tentatively putting forward their ideas in a hostile environment have been extraordinary. And yet, the state has continued to grow. The share of GDP taken by governments has continued to expand. The monopolies that have existed around the world in healthcare and education and so on remain uh, unaffected. It's as though nothing has changed in terms of public policy. Now, why is that? How is it that we have so totally failed to translate our intellectual victory into public policy? Well, it's not because we fail to convince people. A large part of the conservative condition is simply reassuring people that they don't need to, uh, to, to be embarrassed about what they think. I remember when I was 15 years old, going to listen to a, an English philosopher called Roger Scruton, who's kind of, the kind of Fred Smith of, uh, of Britain in the sense that he's the unthinking man's thinking man. He, he uh, <laughs> provides the, the script. And, and I said to him, uh, rather precociously, you might think, being 15 at the time, I said, what do, you see, uh, what do you see as the role of a conservative thinker? And he, blinking behind his glasses in the diffident manner he had, he said, the role of a conservative thinker is to reassure the people that their prejudices are true. <laughs> and, you know, that is, it, th there is a, the more I think about that, the truer it becomes. Of course, it's not an original, uh, completely original thought due to Roger Scruton. There is a, a, a wonderful passage in Burke's Reflections on the French Revolutions where he makes exactly this point, and he makes it much more uh, graphically. He says, because half a dozen crickets concealed beneath a fern, make the field ring with their importunate chink, while thousands of great cattle take their repose in the shade of the British oak and are silent. Pray do not imagine that those who make all the noise are the only inhabitants of the field. Now, isn't that the most wonderful description of how we are governed today? Cast your mind back to the bailout three years ago. How immediately a political and media cast formed itself phalanx-like into a position defending the idea that we had to respond by spending more, by borrowing more, by taxing more. I, I can remember being virtually the only, in fact, I, I think I was the only elected British Conservative at the time to be against it. Plenty are now being wise after the event. And I remember at the time uh, raising this with a very senior member of my party. And he emailed me back and said, you are completely on your own on this, Hannon. You are utterly alone. He said, all right, it's you and Ron Paul. You're the only people uh, in the world who are, against, uh, who are against what's happening. Well, 10 days later, the first opinion poll came out, in, uh, since I see their correspondent here in Her Majesty's Daily Telegraph. And I was able to supply a link to this and send a, a gleeful email back to this very senior member of my party saying, look, it turned out to be me, Ron Paul, and 80% of the British electorate. <laughs> People on both sides of the Atlantic are wiser than their leaders.
The role of an organization like this is to reassure people that their prejudices are true. So why is it, why is it, since we all live in democracies, that on issues like that, public opinion is not able to impose itself on people who are, after all, dependent on the ballot box for the maintenance of their employment? And I think the answer is that the, the modern minister finds himself running a machine that has grown so large, so immobilist, so unresponsive, that with the best will in the world, there is very little he can do. The lot of the modern minister is to find himself encased in some vast machine. He's jabbing away furiously at buttons that have long become disconnected. He's tugging madly at levers that have worked loose because every idea he has to drive through some reform, some change, is frustrated by serried ranks of civil servants whose entire Weltanschauung uh, is based on saying, oh, you can't do that, minister. We have to keep the, the, the status quo going. There's a statutory six-month consultation period before we're even allowed uh, uh, to discuss it. Now, this process has gone much further on my side of the Atlantic than it has on yours. There's a number of things here which serve to keep your elected representatives in check which are more or less unique to the United States. Term limits, referendum and ballot procedures, open primaries, perhaps the most significant, proper separation of powers, the direct election of all these public officials from the sheriff to the school board. You may not realize how, uh, how lucky, how unusual you are in having these defensive ramparts against an overweening state. If you forget how blessed this country is, you only have to look at the other side of the Atlantic. Okay, you had your problem with the bailouts. We've now taken that to its next logical stage in Europe, where instead of bailing out banks and rescuing some very wealthy individuals from the consequences of their errors, we are now bailing out whole countries, and with much larger sums of money. Except we're not really bailing out those countries. What we're, of course, doing is bailing out the euro. We have this extraordinary situation now, where hundreds of billions of dollars are being committed in loans to profligate governments, because the European elites cannot contemplate a future without continued monetary integration. So instead of allowing the stricken economies to do what every orthodox economic, indeed every unorthodox economic model, left or right, would tell them to do, which is to devalue and to price their way back into the market, these countries are being sacrificed in order to keep the single currency going. 